This episode is sponsored by Lens Protocol. Lens lets you own your own social media presence, easily monetize your content, and carry your social graph with you wherever you go. That means you, the creator, can focus on creating without ever having to worry about losing access to your account or having to build a new following again. Lens also lets you engage more closely with your fans, directly monetize your work, and if you're a dev, easily spin up a new app with Lens's full suite of developer tools. Go to lens.xyz to claim the last social media handle you'll ever need. Hey everybody, welcome to episode one of season five. I'm your host, Diana Chen, and today to kick off the new season, we are talking about competitive communities and culture through the lens of esports. There's no better person to talk about this topic than Sursu, one of the founders of Black Hand, an on-chain esports organization that leverages innovative technology to compete and build open and accessible experiences for their community. To provide some context for those who may be new to the esports and gaming world, esports, short for electronic sports, refers to organized competitive video gaming. You can think of it as professional sports for video gamers. Just like in pro sports, there's a whole ecosystem surrounding esports that includes dedicated leagues, international tournaments, both online and offline, team sponsorships, professional player contracts, esports commentators who are called casters in the esports world, and of course, a very passionate fan base who, just like in pro sports, have their favorite players and teams that they like to very enthusiastically root for. The culture around esports is vibrant, diverse, and constantly evolving. Esports communities are fueled by a shared competitive spirit, which can be a ton of fun and a bonding experience, but it can also raise some challenges as well. All we have to do is think back to playing Monopoly games when we were kids to remember how quickly a game can go from being just fun and games to overly contentious, and that same competitive spirit and passion can very quickly turn into anger and infighting within competitive communities like esports organizations. Sursu shares some of his experiences managing the community at Black Hand, including what he has done to foster an inclusive and welcoming community within the confines of competition, and how he has handled conflicts that have arisen amongst community members along the way. He also shares his thoughts more broadly on the role of leaders and facilitators within a competitive community and how that differs from a traditional competitive community to a decentralized one like Black Hand, as well as some Web3 principles and tools he has incorporated into Black Hand and thinks other competitive communities could benefit from as well. Something else I think Cersei has done really well with Black Hand and understands really well in general is how to build a community around culture. I have interviewed countless people over the years about culture and have found that culture is one of the most difficult concepts to explain, largely because it is so much just a feeling or an intuition people have and not really something we can quantify. But you guys, I have to say, Circe's attempts at explaining culture in words is probably the best explanation I've heard. And I know this is a long episode, but I would highly encourage all of you to listen until the end so that you can hear his explanations, analogies, and stories behind how culture has been such a big part of and so deeply ingrained in his family for generations, even before he was born. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Circe. Hey, Sursu, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great as well. I feel like this is such a long time coming. I know we were just talking about this off air, but I was supposed to have you on the podcast like a year ago or maybe more, maybe less. Neither of us has any concept of time, so we don't know. Exactly. But I'm glad we're finally making it happen. Shout out Stefan for nominating you and everybody for voting you on. I'm just excited that you're here and I'm excited to talk to you. And there are a million things I could talk to you about. So I really made an effort to focus today on a couple of the main things that I think you've gone really deep into and you can speak really well on. And those are competitive communities and culture. And we're going to talk about these in the context of esports, which is sort of the world that you live in. So I I actually want to 
start all the way back. I'm not going to ask you how you got into Web3 or anything. I'm going to start all the way back from when you were a child. If my memory doesn't fail me, I, I believe I heard you say that you started playing chess when you were like three years old or something like that. And through that, you eventually got into video gaming. But you've always kind of had this competitive bone in your body, it seems like, or you've just really enjoyed that competitive element. Is there something characteristic of competitive communities like chess communities or gaming communities? communities that has always drawn you in or um, have you just found yourself in these competitive communities your entire life just by virtue of enjoying gaming that is an incredible question i'm gonna step back really quick and also be like shout out to my boy step thank you so much bro i love you you're amazing so three four ish my folks got me into playing chess i remember when i was i think seven or eight and I was going through some of like my old stuff when I was a younger child that I had no memory of they were like oh yeah so you won this chess tournament and this and a bunch of other things and I was just like I was really doing that that's crazy but I think what's really awesome is like I've always been a very curious kid if you ask my mom and if you knew my dad and you asked him he would have told you I was into everything I was the type of kid where you would be asked to go to sleep but I would be so quiet, almost ninja-like, where I could stay in the same room and watch TV, listen to conversations, whatever, and no one would even know I was there. So I was always constantly soaking up knowledge and thoughts, and I guess I was just very inventive at that point. So they were like, okay, this kid has boundless energy. So putting me in a competitive space was something that kept me really active. And I think they were like, oh my God, we gave him more energy. Oh, what are we going to do with this kid? But it was great, right? So, you know, I found myself in chess. I found myself, my brother and I and my dad, we did Taekwondo together in boxing. We competed in that. We would go to regional events in like New Jersey. We would beat all the kids there in our belt class that it would just end up being like my brother and I competing for the final. And it happened like that several times. Like we both kind of have that massive competitive drive. And then when video games, when I got a chance to get my hand on that, like Pokemon, for example, I was trying to find ways to compete. Let's see who's doing this, who's doing that. I would even host my own tournaments. I remember in middle school, I uh, would organize Beyblade, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon tournaments at lunch. I would have kids put up a pot of like whatever fake money we got from class or whatever the case is. And we would wager those things out. Like I was very, very into creating a competitive environment at any given chance I could get, whether it was to see whether or not I could stack up or just to kind of see how other folks would solve problems. It just became a very creative exercise for me to watch how other people would battle it out. And I think trading card games is a very good example of really sussing out who can be inventive and creative or who's very adaptable or who has something where their strategy is very, very ironclad. And those things were very, very fun for me. It helped me, I think, even in abstract, when my career got into design, it helped me really figure out like unorthodox thinking was kind of like my calling card. I think that's so cool because when I was a kid, I was never much of a gamer. And I think I just never saw gaming as this creative outlet or the strategic outlet, both things which I'm very interested in. Maybe just the influence from my parents, like telling me not to like sit on video games all day. Now, now that I've actually started to learn about gaming and what that entails in the last maybe couple of years, now that I'm an adult, I'm like, this is all so fascinating. I wish I had gotten into gaming as a kid or when I was younger, when I had more time to actually spend on it, because now it's like, you know, maybe I don't have so much time to learn a new game and to develop those skills from scratch. But I think that's super cool. And not to call you out, but didn't you also skip school for like a week so that you could get good at a game and beat your friends or something yes, like that? Yes, 100. I remember... <laughs> I was in Florida, moved there for high school, and my other co-founders for Black Hand destroy me in Halo. And I was very frustrated. I was like, I gotta get good at this game. So I feigned sick and was telling my mom, I'm not going to school. And I was grinding any chance I could get. And thankfully I had my own room so I could kind of like lock the door a little bit. What I did was I was like, okay, let me do my homework. I just get it out the way and just ask my friend like, yo, just send me what I need to do, did that. And then I was in the back just going, at it. I made a new account so they didn't know it was me because at the time Xbox Live was big so if you knew your friend was online you were going to hit him up. So I was like nah let me make another account and then later I get invited over to a friend's house and I just start going pulse so they're like how did you and they were like you've been doing this when you were sick weren't you? So yeah. You got caught. I was, That's hilarious. I was dedicated. I was very dedicated. I can see that. I can very much see that. On this podcast we talk about community building a lot. When you think about competitive communities though which we haven't really really 
talked about here. Do you think that competitive element makes these communities stronger or do you think it makes them more susceptible to conflict and collapse? That's a very good question. I think competition is rooted in conflict, but I think the lens of conflict really just kind of determines how that community is going to end up either collapsing or being stronger as a result of it. You know, I think the one thing that I think about a lot is sort of like play is an atomic building block for humanity, right? We find ways to play with each other when we're kids, when we're adults, when we're teens. There's an element of wonder, surprise, amazement, and invention when we're coming together to find enjoyment with ourselves, right? And video games, in a way, really help dial that to 11 because you have a lot of different types of sensory inputs it's not just kind of like you and maybe the strength of your collective imagination playing together but it's now channeled through a conduit that's like dreaming up or imagining this world for you that you get a chance to get lost in and in certain cases when you add the competitive element to play from something as innocuous as i bet you can't run as fast as me to the other end of the street has now turned into multi-million dollar tournaments where people are racing for track and field or whatever the case is right so i think when when there's a sense of competition, you get a chance to really understand yourself and understand the strengths and weaknesses of everyone else. And I think if a community knows how to leverage competition as a means of discovery and championing the differences of each person that is competing, then you're better for it. You're stronger for it. But if you use it as a way to create dissent and discord, then yeah, you're, that's what you're going to receive. And I think a lot of competition toes the line between those things. And it really takes a great facilitator or organizer in a sense in order for you to kind of create a healthy competitive environment environment versus an unhealthy one. Talk more about what that looks like, because I think there's a fine line between healthy competition and good vibes and having a supportive community versus getting into a lot of community infighting. So as a leader in an esports organization, what are your strategies for staying on the right side of that line? So when I wrote the guidelines for player agreements and a few other things that we have, one of the things that I always mentioned is about passion. Passion's good, but passion has to be channeled. Passion works similar to anger. They're almost, in many ways, brother and sister. When both are unchecked, they become dangerous because they don't have a conduit to be channeled into. And so I always talk about it's good to be passionate about what you're doing, what's happening, but you have to practice awareness that these passions don't kindle flames that are uncontrollable. And this goes into sportsmanship. This goes into, for example, having a non-tolerance policy when players who act in a way that antagonize other folks during competition, those are things that aren't good. And these are things that we have a non-tolerance policy about. And it takes having a very clear stance as to how we represent ourselves when we do play with each other. That is very, very important. So we have to set real boundaries and we also have to enforce them. So for example, we had several situations last year where we had some members that we hired, one of which had sexual misconduct. We had to get rid of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just something we can't have. It's something that we had to take very seriously. And so if you waffle and waver on those things, it destroys your value system. It creates degradation in the culture that you're trying to set in which people should feel like they have an opportunity to play and exist here unfettered by these types of issues. And when those issues arise, that we administer care first and foremost, and we take the root of the issue out. We had another issue where a player was massively antagonistic against a few others in competition. And unfortunately, because we took him off the roster, we were not able to compete in the event that we qualified for. But the way that I look at it is, if we did compete and we got further, it only in a way like supports the fact that, oh, because this person is good at what they do, we excuse bad behavior. That's just something that we couldn't we couldn't deal with. So I think we have to set great boundaries and then we also have to enforce them and we have to live with the decision of enforcing those things. What we don't want is folks that are within our community looking at us and saying, we are just like everyone else, that we accept bad because it makes us money or we accept bad because it gives us progress within our competitive scene or we make passes because of whatever other type of reason and nothing really outweighs giving care to individuals or giving care to our community. So that's what we value first and foremost. We do that, then we have a safe space in which people can play. Absolutely. So are these values and rules, code of conduct, These are these all things that you established and put in a writing before you started Black Hand? Or are these things that kind of developed 
out of the community once the community was formed? It was a little bit of both. So we had a few of these things in mind already before we decided to find teams, scout players and things of the nature. And that was something I always had in mind where our goal was if we had the affordability to get pros, then we could do that. But I think the better story is how do we get folks that need a fair shake or a fair shot and provide them an opportunity to climb within these competitive communities. But to do so, we still have to establish a good culture and we're learning from these folks as much as they're learning from us. And so if we come to them to set a type of precedent, then it only allows them to kind of really move in concert with us rather than trying to build something in reaction to a bad a bad action. And because we had some of these things in place, we already sort of knew what our policy was going to be as it arise. So we didn't have to debate it in that case, right? For the two situations I talked about, it didn't take us long for us to know what we were going to do. We pretty much was like, let's get a full assessment of the situation, but this pretty much calls for an immediate ban. And that's what it was. Another thing that I think really stands out about Black Hand is how much you guys have really leveraged innovative technology with blockchain and Web3 and things like that to enhance your community. Can you talk about how you've used innovative tech in the case of Black Hand and then how other competitive communities can really leverage technology to make their community better or to go further together or to, you know, grow in, in whatever other way? I'd say if it wasn't for Mirror Crowdfund, we wouldn't exist. Full stop. I mean, it's just the, the industry already is going through massive market correction. The VC bubble has burst. No one is really interested in investing unless you've already built like an incumbent business. For example, M80 just received $3 million in funding, but the dude who started this was a co-founder of Xset, and Xset's already a pretty amazing business or esports organization and they're getting into web3 they just signed bryson maybe a few months ago so if you don't have those kind of reps then the way to get someone to fund you has to be a lot more creative a lot of esports is either co like collectively been vc folks funding something that might be birthed out of a passion project from a business let's say like shopify has shopify rebellion as a team or like tyson foods has tyson gaming or it was someone with disposable income that's just able to say i want to get into esports and then funds it like uh, i would say like um oh my god i forgot the team name but they're run by juju smith schuster who's like a football player you know he has disposable income it's like i want to build a brand so there's a way to do that shout out to that team i'm sorry i don't know your name right now so you have a couple of those different things and so we needed to figure out like how do we build momentum so that we could kind of get started in a crowdfund through you know web three means was our way of doing that i would also say perpetual auctions from announce builder is another great way in which we kind of help build retention and build folks that are dedicated to want to help support our DAO. but i'd also i would say honestly the biggest thing that was very, very important for us was writing proposals, being completely transparent about our process. So for example, our Apex Legends team that is going to be playing in the global playoffs next month, when we picked that team up and we were writing a proposal, our community member, Ellen Do, who co-wrote it, talked to us and said, well, if we put this out in public, what if another organization outbids us? To me, I think that's the point because what happens is we create transparent price discovery for other teams that might be similarly in talent to the team that we're looking into. They kind of have a better understanding about what a team of that caliber is worth. The players have a better sense of kind of like what they might be worth playing in this competitive ecosystem. And it creates a better environment overall where if somebody wants to really bid, well, we have a public view of here's what this team is willing to pay for. Which means if you're a team that has maybe more disposable income than them or more revenue than them, whatever the case is, the players can negotiate their terms better. And I think like that's something that the space doesn't really have. We don't really have a players union. We don't really have opportunities in which these folks can advocate for the best terms while they're playing. They don't even have the security and that certain organizations are actually going to pay them at all. They get signed, they do all this work, and then nothing happens to them at the end of the day, right? And I think that that's a bad way to do business. So for us, by these teams looking at our treasury and seeing, oh, well, if they're offering this and they have this much, well, they could definitely afford that because the money is there. I don't have to guess. And I think that level of transparency is what truly makes us stand out from anyone else. Would you say that's the biggest difference you see between a decentralized esports organization and a traditional esports organization is sort of that power that you put back into the hands of the players to like negotiate their own terms and make sure that they're getting a fair rate for what they deserve? Absolutely. 
Yes, that's 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 I would say eighty percent of what makes us different. I think the other twenty percent is the fact that we have community members that can manifest anything that they want from the DAO. And we've had community members already help shape Black Hand in amazing ways. And we have other members that have now just joined us that are casters of particular Apex Legends regions. Shout out to Brad. Folks that have casted for other games. Shout out to S Proxy from PUBG Mobile in Africa, for example, where they could say, hey, we want to create an event and we want your organization to back it in this region. They can pitch that proposal to our community and it could be funded. So ways in which now our organization could be integral to the growth of a particular region in esports is, is now possible in a much more transparent and meaningful way than it ever has been. What would you say is your biggest piece of advice for somebody who's just starting to build a competitive community? Yo, patience is honestly the biggest thing. Whether it's competing in Web 2 games, whether it's competing in Web 3 games, whether it's like, you know, fostering a competitive environment with a game that you work for, patience is key. And it takes a lot of listening so that you can understand really what these folks are saying. And patience is definitely key because you have to start from somewhere. Your community might just be you and the team that you work with. And then you have to start talking about what you're doing and getting other folks to be interested in what you're doing and then building a means to retain that attention. And it's not necessarily doing just like, I'm gonna talk on social media all day, but it's really about building relationships and building meaningful relationships take time. It's not something that happens overnight. If you want an overnight relationship, you call that a transaction. That's like literally what that is. When you really wanna build a community, it takes it takes a lot of time and it takes having a vision that is digestible, that people can understand. And if you need help with that, then to ask for help and to allow other people, give them the agency to help co-shape that vision with you. I would not be able to do Black Hand if it wasn't for my core team, if it wasn't for the players that came when we first started. For example, our first player we signed, his name is Rain, and I wrote him a crazy long Twitter DM about why I was doing Black Hand and why I wanted to like build something new and different. And with his help, he helped us build our visibility in Apex Legends. And then with all the other players that came as a result of that, it helped cement our name. And so now we're at a position to where that name is being carried in a global playoff, which hopefully if we do well, means that we'll be going back to another world tournament in our second year. And that's like something that is invaluable to me, right? And it's about ensuring that the folks that have helped pave the way for you or with you also get their flowers too. So yeah, it's really relationships are, are key here. Absolutely. Yeah, that's something that I've, I've said a lot too. I think a lot of people in the space are, you know, want to know how do we scale community, which I think just not really a possible thing to do. Or the only way to do that really is just to bring more community builders on who are building those one on one relationships. But there's no way to automate that process. Right. You know, we're all about how do we automate the process? How do we make it more efficient? How do we scale faster and bigger and make more revenue? Like if that's where your head's at, like you're not probably going to be establishing the most meaningful and strong relationships because like you said, it does take time. There's no way to scale it. It's really just a, a one to one process that you repeat over and over over and over again and as one person you can only do that so much with so many hours in the day right you gotta like you know the thing is you gotta understand that there's community then there's like a fan club then there's consumers and you've got to be comfortable with knowing who some of those people are and i think like in the beginning folks that if you are crowdfunding like we did i would consider those ogs and the people that have been with us since the beginning that's a part of my community which means like my responsibility to those people means that i have to communicate to them more like my opportunity is in building a much stronger relationship they bought into the vision but now i have to like make sure that they are there in lockstep as we're building it together so that's that's more time but when i'm talking about like maybe selling merchandise and expanding our reach those are consumers those are people that might also be our fan club like people who are very very into supporting what we're doing and buying all the things that we do which now means that they've entered in a different type of transactional relationship with us which i think earns some sort of reward or some sort of mutualism but then there are just other people who are just going to just 
just consume, which means they may not pay for anything, but they may watch our live streams. They may share our tweets. They may like our posts. And like, it's okay to have those. But I think from a revenue perspective, if people are thinking about revenue, what you're really saying is how do I get those people who have engaged with us for free, how do I get them to pay for things now? And I think that's okay to have that kind of conversation, but I think it's bad or a misnomer to conflate those same people with community. I just think that just like, I, I don't think that works for me. And I think from a perspective of building culture, you know, there are people who are going, that are buying from culture. There are people buying so that they can receive culture and you've got to know the difference between the two of those things and actually like be okay with segmenting who those are i don't think things work in kind of like these blurred lines that i think web3 wants to kind of force it's okay to know that like these are people who are not going to be talking with us are not going to be here in our town halls but will buy everything that we have like that's dope you're a fan you're a massive so super mega fan but you're not interested in our day to day and that's okay speaking of culture that is something else i want to talk to you about because it's something you talk Talk about all the time culture 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 you've got probably like a hundred tweets oh about my culture God, probably. which i love i think the thing about culture that is has been challenging for me is that there's no really like definition or like hard metric for measuring culture or for defining culture a lot of it is just this feeling that you know and that you sense but that you can't exactly put words on. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that. I feel like the the inherent nature of culture just stems from kind of like an idea that captivates a group of individuals. There's a, a care to those folks that are also within that same mind sphere, or that same mental space. Once it starts to become more mainstream, then the care related to nurturing said culture starts to dissipate. And I think that's where things go from culture culture as in a community versus culture as in a consumable good. Interesting. Can you elaborate on that thought a little bit more? For sure. Yeah. Like I think the best way of looking at this is like hip hop music, right? It's it's in its 50, it's its 50th year. Started as a happy accident, became a means in which a community that was literally on fire in the Bronx, which has its own sociopolitical issue, right? Like if you think about the, the Bronx at the time, landowners found this loophole, this legal loophole where you could claim more insurance money through fire damage, through arson. So they would intentionally burn their land so that they could claim the money. They didn't give a shit that people were living in those places. So the city is on fire, literally, and people are displaced from their homes. And this happy accident enables them to speak about what's going on, but also as a means of escape. That becomes a culture in which there's a mutual understanding between, I understand what you're going through. I understand where you're coming from. And it became a rally cry for other folks that were dealing with something similar and all the other boroughs. So you've got something that became like this this means of massive storytelling that then permeates throughout the world until now it's become hyper derivative and there's obviously like the argument that any person in music will say is like there's so many amazing still gems of hip-hop that exist which is definitely true but i think in aggregate when you look at kind of like how folks are consuming who's buying this music who's consuming this music and what it has meant for i guess globalization as a whole the initial sort of like messages and the care related to how how hip hop was delineated and talked about and curated is vastly different than it is now where hip hop becomes a means to sell commercials it's become a means to sell product it's become a means to sell to sell it's now a a tool for people to consume things rather than it being a a tool to release stress tension strife all types of you know emotional elements and things and it doesn't necessarily mean that like culture doesn't come without some sort of means of like buying it or supporting it or sustaining it i think commerce has sort of always been kind of like intertwined with cultural spaces whether the capital is social capital or if it's like financial capital or what have you but i think at a certain point as it reaches the larger masses the artifacts of that culture became tools to now just sell things to people rather than it being to use it for whatever its actual intentions were can it be both though like are those two things mutually exclusive like can it be true that some people still listen to hip-hop because they understand you know they really feel it they understand the experiences the feelings that go behind it and then other people are using it to monetize can it be both things and is that necessarily a bad thing that it's both because maybe that monetization aspect of it is what gives them the opportunity to keep doing what they're doing which then feeds into the people that listen to hip-hop and feel the music and experience it 
which then encourages artists to make more. And it's kind of like this kind of like a mutually beneficial cycle in some ways. In a way. And I think when you think about like indie artists um, and like going to a show and supporting them and buying their merch, I would say falls more in line to culture in like that localized environment. I think like over time though, when culture gets too big or when a cultural thing gets too big, the attribution changes. And I think this is where like Web3 is really integral and interesting is because more direct attribution and value distribution can be possible where like so going back to like an artist what would hip-hop look like for instance if we were able to attribute all of the people that basically incepted hip-hop from its grassroots level whether it was the listener the person that carried the vinyl that set up the speakers the djs the mcs the dancers right all those people what if we were able to properly attribute those folks or at least give them some value based upon now the fact that hip-hop is a cultural zeitgeist but that doesn't happen right now. And even with the musicians that exist now, right? Like how they are being valued and attributed to is imbalanced. Where it's the people who are doing the aggregation, the people that are that promise the distribution, the people that are saying, let us manage you. Those are the folks that are getting most of the value out of this. So when we think about like, is the culture nurturing those that are participants in that culture? As it gets to a certain critical mass, we start to see the degradation of that process happen. And I think that's where like things become better. I think it's great when people can share something that they've cultivated and it becomes something that other people can see the beauty in and want to participate in. I think that that is amazing. But I also think to a certain degree, cultures that are localized are very, very special because it it inspires people to visit those places, to go to those places, to actually experience it. And that they could take a little bit of a back with them home, but they know like that's where that thing is. And so that's why we're like called to travel. That's why we're called to connect with people from different walks of life, because you can find amazing similarities, but you can also really celebrate and champion those differences. And if everyone sort of has sort of like the same things, then what is it about it that makes us different and i think when culture becomes mainstream i think there's also a race to like making things homogenous i think that's a dangerous thing because it doesn't allow us to really celebrate what makes us human at least in my opinion so with that said do you think there's something innately exclusive about culture like there's something about culture where it's like because we all lived in the bronx and we're going through it during this time period we are part of this culture that only we have experienced and that other people haven't experienced. When I think about a lot of different types of culture, it kind of seems like they all stem from this, like you said, a shared idea or a shared experience or something like that, which feels like it's always like exclusive in some way, shape or form. So I guess like my question is, do you think there there is something inherently exclusive about culture? And if so, how do we still promote inclusivity and make people feel like they're welcome to experience this with us and that we're open to a diverse group of people to show them our culture? How do we like square these two things? I think it's like, um, it's almost innocuous as like, for example, did you grow up having a shoes off policy in your house? Yeah. Okay. So did I, but the way in which your family derived that and the way in which mine did is different, but we share something though. Right. And I think what's interesting is even though folks from the Bronx had their own experience and that's what kind of created hip hop, they didn't stop Queens from saying, yo, I fuck with what you're saying. As a matter of fact, yo, I dig, I dig your issue. We got similar things going on over here and I feel like that's actually a perfect way we can express our strife too. And so like the culture of hip hop is not necessarily the tool or like how someone rhymed or whatever the case is, right? But it was just more of like this feeling of there's this rhythm that we want to get out. There's this thing that we want to do. And like the music became the conduit for that. And so that doesn't stop anybody from taking and participating in it. But I think again, it really goes back to attribution. Like they made it, but because they made it, it's now an opportunity for me to get my thoughts off. And then that goes to the next borough. Yo, I like how y'all did it. It's different from how they do it. I'm gonna do it this way. And hip hop wouldn't exist in its same way if the Bronx was like, nah, you gotta rap like us. Queens was like, nah, like we gotta do it. We gotta do it the way that Queens does it. Manhattan said we gotta do it the way we do it. You know, Staten Island like, yo, we completely away from y'all niggas. Like we gotta do it a different way too. So, you know, like I think inclusivity comes from hip hop. The tool was open source and we all championed the fact that, yo, I actually like how you do that. That's ill, that's ill, that's ill. We could collaborate 
now. And so when you're seeing dudes from Harlem, Uptown, like Rakim, like collaborating with the Wu-Tang, for example, whatever the case is, that's big. So I think it's I think it's a, a, a way of sort of understanding like what are the artifacts and the tools of the culture that are open source and that enable us to kind of like borrow from those things and then contextualize it in our own way, right? Like I had a shoes off policy because I grew up in an Islamic household. That was just something that we did and something I learned from going to the masjid and things of the nature. And I, I do that any and everywhere. And yours might be derived from a completely different set of doctrines and practices, but there's a commonality between the two of us, even though our, our differences are completely, you know, and it's in the acceptance of those differences that makes the inclusivity possible. Because it's like, no matter what, no matter where we come from, there are going to be things that we share. And if not, then let's find things that we can share so that we can have a bond. That's so well said. I don't think I've ever heard anyone explain culture in such, like, such a good way. Oh, I appreciate it. Such a smart <laughs> I appreciate it. God, I'm just like, I'm still like letting that sit with me for a second. That was really good. Um, Something else I wanted to ask you about, and it's because I saw you tweet about it recently, and, and it's been in the news and whatever, is like this whole thing with Supreme, which streetwear, that's kind of like another big thing. You know, we've been talking about hip hop, but streetwear has been a big thing since in the 90s. I mean, I would say like- Or even before that. I guess people classified streetwear probably like like 80s, 90s, but I feel like streetwear in a way is, de is derived from- workwear like if you think about like how folks were dressing 20s 30s what have you well you had folks that were like in the fly suits and whatever and then you had folks that were kind of in more of the commoner suit type of thing and that was just something where it was like streetwear was always like a derivative of like class issues from a fashion perspective and then you 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 go into kind of like the invention of the t-shirt that definitely took a hold of every man post world war ii <laughs> then you know you you've kind of got like something that was very relaxed and when you think about like society at the time it was always about kind of like what the model upstanding citizen looked like and it wasn't someone that looked like they came from a farm right that just wasn't what was good in cities but that's what you know we ended up um you know it was because it's easy to make like you didn't have to go to a tailor to get a suit the t-shirt is easily replicatable so it became at some point a canvas and i think that that's what like really made things really interesting is there was already a rejection of it because of how sort of simple its construction was. And now you've got a rejection of it because it's like, you're putting art on this or scribbles or whatever. Like, what are you doing? And I think when you look at, you know, groups like Stussy, for example, that was precursor to Supreme, they're probably one of the real, real true vanguards of streetwear. And then you had at the time, especially when hip hop was freaking things, like you got the, the Ballys, the Pele's and all that other kind of stuff. Like the fly gear was part of streetwear from like the hip hop cultural perspective. And then that, recontextualize other things like Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger. They hated the fact that like Wu-Tang was wearing Ralph Lauren. They hated it. They were like, yo, why do we have Raekwon wearing Snow Beach? You don't know shit about Snow Beach. Why is he wearing this? I don't like this. And like Tommy Hilfiger was racist as hell. But it was, but it was one of those things where like, we're looking at it like, damn, that's fresh. Because again, going back to competition, which is very funny. It was like braggadocio. Like, yo, you ain't got what I got. I'm on this new thing. I'm on this new thing. So at some point, everybody was wearing ballets or whatever. So it was like, fuck, what else is out there? Yo, I like how funky Tommy Hilfiger got they Jones. Like, what if I wore that with the Timbs? That's different. Nobody know nobody knows how that, you know, how that works. Or, you know, like let me get the Air Force Ones with the Snow Beach John and everything else, whatever. So it was always about this mixing and matching and recontextualizing. And I think when you look at kind of like Supreme when they came through, it was taking a bit of that invention and using really interesting materials, but also saying, How do we go back to simplification? Like things were getting real funky. You look at the nineties, it was patterns and shit everywhere. And they're like, That's hard. That's different. And wait, I gotta sit in line to get these? Nah, there's something about this that's different. Nobody else is gonna know about this because I gotta be one of the first few hundred to pull up and sleep overnight to get the thing. So there was always this interesting kind of like, you ain't got what I got that has been a staple from like, I guess a hip hop perspective. And I think that really translated into streetwear very, very well because the, I guess, underdog, the struggle, all those other types of things felt very reminiscent to each other. If hip hop was like the beat of the street, then streetwear was like the, uh, the visual for what that was like. So that's why Supreme is lame now because they've sold out, but they've sold out for a while. I think at a certain point in time when you have a corporate overlord or corporate master that has to dictate to you how much you got to sell, who you may need to work with or how to change your manufacturing process or whatever the case is, then things are different. You don't have that type of creative control or that overhead on how you want to continue to speak with or speak to 
or at least be part of a culture that you help shape. And that's a very interesting thing, like a point of irony where Supreme was a massive shaper of culture and has now become in a way like outside of its own self. And I think that like it speaks to growth, it speaks to change, but I think because we're human, we have the opportunity to assess what type of changes we want. And for the folks that sold Supreme and got what they wanted from it, I think for them, they did what they set out to do. But that also means for folks that are maybe hanging on to it or upset that Supreme isn't cool anymore, I think it's okay to, to say they've done what they've done. Now it's time for someone else to take the torch and do something interesting and cool with it. Which is why for me, I can call Supreme lame and it doesn't really affect me personally. It's fine. Like they've done their purpose. They got us here. You think about streetwear culture now, like people will mention OG Supreme as one of their influences. It's never gonna go away. No matter how lame they get now, People are always going to say, yo, Supreme got me into streetwear. Supreme got me into skateboarding. Supreme got me into this. Supreme got me into that. They'll quote OG artists and be like, they all had Supreme box logo in every every rhyme. So these things are inextricably linked to the culture, but we can always feel free to assess and say whether or not they're still active participants in it. And it's okay that they're not. It reminds me of um, a brand or an entity called Colette, one of the most prolific streetwear or street fashion, cultural brand, relevant brands out of Paris, run by Sarah Endelman. And she closed shop after 20 years. Like she said, it was an active choice to say, you know what, I think I've done what I could do for the space. And I'm taking a break. I'm good. And folks were like, no, no, Colette, you got to stay, you got to come back. I was upset. I never got a chance to go visit it. But I think what was interesting was her story was something that she said, I'm not going to pervert what we've done here. There are plenty of opportunities that we could still do, but today is the day where I say we're closing shop. And I think like having that type of ability to actively say we've done what we could for a thing is good because it speaks to a healthy space of saying things live and end. Not everything has to stay forever. And I think what certain people fight is like finding legacy within this work, finding long lasting staying power long after they're gone within this work. And I think, you know what, like, I even talk about this too, like if Black Hand manages to like stay past me, then hopefully those that carry that torch operate it with the same values that I have, or at least the same semblance of values. But if it goes before I go, or if it goes when I go, that's fine too. I think it's perfectly healthy for us to have our page in life, and then that's it. The folks that are here that are reading it, dope. Folks that are here that may read it later, amazing. And if we fade away in obscurity at some point, that's fine. I mean... Hopefully with the blockchain, people will find us again. I love that mentality. And I think that's so important to remember because I feel like in our society, anytime something ends, it's considered a failure and people aren't happy about that. But it's like, what if we re reframe that instead of seeing any kind of end as a failure as like, this is just the end of the book. Like every book, every movie has an ending. This is the ending. Like why, why can't we accept that as like, this is just how the story ends, you know? And th there is no sequel and that's okay. And this is just how it ends. 100%, 100%. Some of my favorite anime like works like that, like Samurai Shampoo, for example, 26 episodes, beginning, middle, end, that's it. People are like, we need more. No, they wrote the story out like this. We have to accept it and cherish that. We're making decisions for someone who's no longer here with the work that they have. And if we had proper attribution from the work while they were still living, then there would be better ways for us to route and continue to develop value for those works that currently exist rather than trying to find new ways to generate value from work that they don't have a say in what to do with anymore. I think there was an interview from Tyler Creator or something where he was like, yo, like all my stuff's gonna be gone. Like you're not gonna see nothing from me. I think it was either him, I forget what, I think I think it was him, I gotta double check. But an artist was just like, nah, yo, when I'm done, like that's it. There's no more work. Whatever I left with is what you guys have to deal with. And like, I love that so much. Yeah, because you know, you, you don't sort of pervert what they have and what they've done. You know, you don't you don't add something else that they, they've had no jurisdiction in being able to, to sort of support unless they had planned on it. Then like, that's a different thing. But if not, which we don't know when we go, we can only plan but so much. So being able to sort of like, I guess the principle of like dying empty, like ensuring that what you've done, you've got all that stuff out of you before you go, or at least as much as you can humanly possibly can. You know, I think that's, a, I think that's a, a good principle to live by. Have you ever wanted to buy an NFT with a group of friends, crowdfund a project or start a collective and found yourself stitching tools together manually to help you make your dreams a reality? I certainly have, and that's why I'm excited to tell you about Lore, the Web3 co-ownership platform. Lore lets you seamlessly spin up a shared wallet, pool resources, and coordinate group activity all in one unified experience. 
Connect to dApps and make any transaction multiplayer. What you can do together is endless. Go to lore.xyz and start a collective today. All right, I, I know we're over time already, so we're gonna wrap up with a quick tweet. We're ending every episode with explain your tweet this season. I pulled a few, but I'm just gonna, I think we just have time for one, so I'm gonna read this tweet. This one is from April 19th of this year, so just a couple months ago. You said, in my mind, brand you and regular you should not be the same. The culture around becoming a brand creates so much rot because you as a person are not always in sales mode and current social forces a lot of us to be in sales 24 seven when our regular selves built a different audience. I just thought it was interesting because I've seen a lot of discourse around how like every employee of a company now is their own brand. And we no longer have this just concept of like the company brand, but we have all these individuals, all these employees or contributors who make up that brand. And so it almost feels like in a way that a lot of people are saying the opposite thing as like, you are the company's brand, like you, you, you are that and you're saying no, they should be separate things. So I, I just be curious to hear more about what, uh, what you meant by for that. For sure. So this, for me, I was, it was addressing a bunch of different things. The first thing was we as just people should not be plugged in online all the damn time. I think what ends up happening is like, because we're always on and always active in, in all these spaces, we're blending both our interpersonal life with like our work life, with like our entertainment and everything else. And it all becomes one blob, which I think is very difficult to like decouple yourselves from. And I think like it leads to burnout and it leads to stress. And I've seen this with individual content creators and artists where they feel like oh like why can't i just make art or why can't i just do this one thing or whatever the case is and it's like because when you're dealing with globalization and when you're dealing with social media the world expects you to literally do all the things at once and so my my whole kind of like purpose of this was to say if you build a brand treat it like building a business build a business has working hours right your business time is from nine to five for example and after five, you should be able to cut that shit off and do whatever the fuck you want later. And I think it's it's difficult because folks are like, well, if I'm not always on, then I'm going to miss an opportunity. And it's like, well, not every opportunity is a good one. You got to have discernment. But also, if you're always dogged from being up all the time, you're not going to see the opportunity when it's in your face. You're not fresh enough to receive it. You don't have enough energy to, to do something with it. So it becomes something else that even if you do get it, like you cast it aside or you forget about it or you don't really treat it with the level of respect that you need to. So you find yourself in this same cycle. So I felt like brand you and regular you, you should be able to separate the two things. You should be able to have an actual real human life of things that have nothing to do with your job, nothing to do with whatever it is that you're building a career out of, and then have that brand you and build it in a way that's that's healthy and build it in a way that's consistent. Because if you if you create a separation, then you're forcing yourself to build a level of consistency between manifesting both realities and a speed that is comparable for yourself when you create that boundary and you got to enforce that boundary if you don't then like you just find yourself where you don't know whether or not you are you or you are a business i personally don't even think that like everyone needs to like personify themselves as a brand i don't know maybe this is a hot take i don't really think everyone is incredibly that interesting right like people will look at what i no, I agree. They'll look at what i do they'll be like he's not that interesting like that's okay like but like i don't i don't think that like Everyone has to turn themselves into a thought leader, write think pieces and shit like that. Like your opinion might probably be the same as a hundred other people. You don't need to necessarily force the issue in that in that respect. You can go home, dude. Like go ahead and chill. Play video games or something if you'd like. So to me, it's just one of those things where I want people to like look at things and say, well, you know what? Like maybe I don't have to think about myself as a business entity because now everything is in pursuit of that business. When you build relationships with people on Twitter, if you're in brand mode, it's about seeing what type of transactions you can get out of that person, whether it's monetary, whether it's like social connection or what have you, but you're not necessarily interested in building an actual relationship with said person. You're not interested. And then when people go and say, oh, so-and-so and such and such is fake. And it's like, well, because they're acting as a brand, like they're not acting as a person to you. And so if you don't want to see people acting as a brand to you, then like you and all those other people have to start acting as people. And that means segmenting and knowing when to contextually say, I am operating as 
my business or I'm operating just as me and I'm doing a check-in, I'm just seeing how you're doing, right? Like there's a difference there. Um, and, and folks like, I think don't really blend, like don't really know how to separate the two things. I feel like there should be a separation. Everybody else could say that there, there isn't, but I definitely feel like there should be. No, I, I totally hear you now, now that you've explained it, it makes a lot more sense. And I think if, if anything too, like that's a really good strategy for preventing burnout. Because I, th I think like, I mean, that's something I fall into personally is I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I'll be like out hiking and checking my phone and replying to telegram messages. And that is like, like that always plugged in sort of mode, I think just is like the, the perfect recipe for burnout, which is what a lot of people in this space experience. So yeah, I totally hear you on that. Well, Sir Sue, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to do this. I'm glad we finally made it happen. Last thing before you go, tell people where they can find you if they want to follow you personally. And then also feel free to plug away with Black Hand or any other projects you're working on. Word. So I am pretty big on Twitter and Telegram at Sir Suhaib, which is S-I-R-S-U-H-A-Y-B. Um you can talk to me about whatever i'm down to chat um and then as far as like black hand's concerned you can find us at blackhand.com uh, we use roman letter roman v's um for the a's and we have no c in our name so if you're thinking about spelling black hand it does not have a c in it thank you very much so yeah so blackhand.com we have a really gnarly theme song and a bunch of other cool things uh check it out let us know what you think um, we have a Discord, we have a discourse for forums, and um, we also have a nouns builder that you can find us at blackhand.wtf um, if you want to participate and join our DAO. I live stream practically every other day at 7 p.m. Eastern. So if you want to see me talk about what I do at Black Hand, if you want to see an active work session on things that I'm doing for the brand or for others, or if you want to check out me just playing a game and making an ass of myself, you should check it out. Uh, Cersei stream pretty much every every day at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thanks so much, Cersei. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you. It was awesome.